right, so I want to say thank you, everyone, for coming to the first one for track two. It's a lot smaller room, a lot more convenient than what we had at the other area, so it's kind of nice. Uh, so the, this presentation is kind of broken up into two different areas. One is just kind of focused on sustainability overall, and then we kind of then, then I move into what our uh, POC is within our uh, China Data Center. And um, I'll have a little video demo at the end to kind of walk through what that looks like. So as you may have noticed, uh, we have three people on the list. I'm the only one here. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Meg was not able to attend today. So I'm going to be covering for her section. Um, and then Yiwa, he actually did a, a recording of a demo of the actual uh, dashboard that was, was put together. And that's actually live within the, the China System Center. So we'll go over that there towards the very end. So a little bit about, my, about myself. So my name is David Cicerano. I have like 25 years of IT experience. I started with um, doing I've been like basically an Apple technician working on iMacs back in the day. So that was really fun, actually, getting your hands dirty. And then uh, started doing DBA work. I'd be basically a database engineer and then moved into architecture. So I've done a lot of architecture. I've done application architecture, infrastructure architecture, and now I'm uh, solutions architect at IBM, and uh, I have two patents under my belt. Finally, hopefully, I was trying to wor work on another one for sustainability. Um, it's, a, it's a big push right now. I think overall around the whole industry about working on you know how we can improve sustainability you know within the data centers and just overall for facility management. Uh, so I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. So it's uh, about this summer it's going to be like 110 degrees, which is I think it's about 40s, 40 degrees C, 45. So it's, it gets pretty warm, but not like you know here in Singapore with the humidity. It's about, probably about the same, I guess, when the sun's bearing down. Yeah, so a little different though. You're not just drenched. At least if you drench, you're being cooled off by the the dryness, which is usually like 10% humidity there. So if you've never been to Arizona, it's it's a nice place to visit. It has a Grand Canyon. Um, so a little bit more about my group. Um, Client engineering, we support multiple different people, or clients, I should say, and we do like engineering workshops. We have them come in and we actually go visit them and kind of understand their problems and work with them to see how we can kind of solve for them. So a couple of uh, clients we work with, I support actually are Cisco, Meta, Google, Microsoft, Nike, Walgreens, and Lowe's. I assume you know some of those. <laughs> and. Um, since Dr. Meg's not here today, we have the Slack session that's going to be live. So if you have any questions, definitely feel free to add it to the, that Slack session. And uh, if there's any questions I can't answer, she will uh, be able to answer those after the uh, meeting today, presentation today. All right, a little bit about the agenda. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is business and technical challenges, sustainable data center overall, you know, what best practices asset and waste management, what that means to you. Uh, and then not kind of talk about the proof of concept that we put, built out within the IBM Data Center here in, in China. And then uh, talk about health and maintenance demo, which is actually, I'll go into the demo, it's like a two minute demo. Um, and at the very end, we actually have some GitHub links. So you can go and actually download the code, run it yourself if you like, and, and try it out. A lot of the modeling, I don't believe is online, uh, but if you have questions about that, we can you know, help you answer those questions. All right, so I'm just going to have some stats real quick. So I'm just going to give a shout out to our sustainability group. They're, they're pretty proud because I worked with them last year trying to help improve a lot of our uh, IT management and waste management. And they, their goal was point, actually 3% of going to landfill or incineration. And we actually met at 0.3%. So they greatly exceeded their expectations of, of you know, either recycling reselling it, reusing it, or actually doing a waste incineration. So they did really good with that. So I want to give them a shout out. Next is just some general stats so you can kind of set some ideas out in everyone's mind. So I've seen for greenhouse gas emissions, I've seen anywhere between one to 3% of the world's usage or the data centers. So it just varies depending on who you, you know, read about, but uh, that's a pretty large percentage, and every year there's more and more data centers being expanding out there. So any way that we can 
use technology to use you know less resources, less assets, and be more efficient with our data, our, our energy usage is, is key, right? Um, next thing is the, the status: fifty percent surveyed organizations seek energy efficient products and services, which is key, and I'll, I'll talk about that later because. One th important thing about waste is making sure you know who your vendors are and what they're, what they do. Because uh, if they're not energy efficient, um, they're not, they're not going to help you. You know, overall, it's your whole sustainability goals. Um, Fifty percent, fifty-two percent of survey organizations seek products that use more recyclable bio biodegradable products, like you know, uh, cardboard, um, different freight stuff. So. Uh, 52%, that's continued to rise overall. There's actually companies that, that's all they do is specialize in biodegradable materials and packaging. Sorry, I'm trying to get this shift. All right, and then the next one is 74% uh, environmental, social, and, and governance factors are very important to enterprise. So I, I'm assuming you guys are here today, so it's, you know, it's important to you to understand what your company's doing and how they're meeting their goals. 50% um, only partner, the people surveyed partner, only partner with people that actually have written down goals and are meeting basically what is required by those different companies. Um, th those commitments come Sorry, I'm having an update come in, so hopefully it doesn't cause any issues. Um, can we, uh, let me just restart real quick. Have uh, only 50% 50 of the partners buy from companies that have communicated commitment sustainability, which is really important because, like I said before, without that commitment, your company can't meet the goals, right? Because if you're working with a company that doesn't care what they're doing, that's not going to help you out, right? Because they can't provide the auditability trail that you require to kind of meet your goals. And one last stat, just for fun. So I found this: seven seven percent of Singapore's energy usage back in 2020 was by data centers, which is pretty great. Uh, that actually has been decreased over the last couple of years, but I was kind of surprised during the whole pandemic, seven percent was actually being consumed within Singapore. So. Data usage and energy usage is, is, is an important factor to look at. Okay, sorry about that. It's a slow response because that update. I do apologize. Um, so just some terminology. So the first one is data center. Right? We also know what data center is. I have some Z mainframes trying to kind of show the example. Um, the next is valve regulated lead acid batteries. That's primarily what the talk is going to be about today. Also refer this to jars. Um, Lithium-ion batteries is also another battery type that's being used. Uh, the primary difference between the two is that um, the lead acid batteries last at between three to five years usually, and have you know about 500 cycles, maybe 700 cycles depending on you know the manufacturer. For lithium-ion, you know you can get 10 to 15 years out of them, and you know maybe 10,000 cycles. It's a lot longer, but the main probably the biggest difference to take in consideration is that the lead acid batteries are like 99 to almost 100% recyclable, where lithium ion is anywhere from like 65 to 95, depending on which geographic region you're in. So it's something to take in consideration, even though they may last longer, you know, if your sustainability goals are required to have, you know, near 100% recyclability. Lithium ion may not be the right choice, but there's, there's always pros and cons to look at. The uh, next thing I might talk about today is a battery string, which is basically just a, a string of jars within the, the UPS. And then, and, and of course, the next is uh, UPS itself, which is usually a group of the strings. They usually call it like a huge battery. And then a subsystem, which is the UPS system itself that supports all those batteries. And then a certificate of proper disposal or manifest. I'll talk about that. So. Many companies call this different things. They could be calling you know, a death certificate, a grave certificate, a recyclable manifest, something that you get from your you know, shipper, supplier, vendor, whoever's doing it, to prove that you've actually recycled your materials. So if you want to get certification on that you, you know, being able to fully recycle your items you know, through some type of certification process, you need to show that company that you can actually audit and show that traceability back from you know, shipping it out to being fully recycled at the actual uh, end uh, shipping spot. All 
right, so uh, business and technical challenges. Job scheduling and prioritization. So one thing that's important, we all think about, you know, when, who, what, it's really important, but something to really take into consideration is why. You know, why the when, why the who, and why the what, right? So for example, why are we doing this maintenance on our systems every six months, every, or every year, right? You need to understand why, because if, if, if that's on a scheduled basis, maybe you can be actually improving on that based on how you can look at you know, monitoring your batteries with sensors and actually looking at ways to do more predictive analysis to see if you can actually reduce those scheduled times or maybe even understanding if there's going to be a failure so that you can replace that battery within you know, two months, six weeks, whatever, depending on you know, your predictable factor. Uh, standardization is really important too. So you know, it doesn't matter what you use. Um, you know, I have IEEE, or you have your own enterprise standards. I think the number one key item to understand is that standardization is so important because it, you might have a particular facility that standards have a particular you know way of doing things, but then what happens if you have on the East Coast people are doing one thing, on the West Coast they're doing something else? then they're, they're conflicting, right? So standardization is super important, specifically, specifically too, because if you're producing data, you need to be able to normalize that data across your whole geo, right? To make sure that whatever you're doing, you actually have a standardized format so that when you're comparing you know, A to B, they're not, you know, it's not one to A, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a good normalization factor between your facilities. Also, vendor management is also super important. So I, if you haven't, worked with your vendor management people before, the third party vendor management people, make sure you make connections because it's, it's super important to understand, you know, what the requirements are to have your vendors come in and service your different equipment because you never know that, you know, over time things change and you may have a certain requirements today to say, okay, supplier A, right, you have to meet these certain requirements to be a new supplier. But after, let's say, two or three, four years, you've had that same supplier, but they've never done a reassessment to see if they still meet the same requirements. And then all of a sudden you find out, hey, we have a certain requirement where we can no longer take paper, right? We can't have something faxed to us. We need to have this digitized, right? So being, setting that communication up with your third party vendors and making sure they understand those requirements are highly important. Asset management, also highly important too, right? So if you, if you don't know what equipment you have, what components make of that equipment, you know, what's in your supply room. Those are all big red flags, right? Because without that information, you can't make better decisions and choices on you know, what you need to do next with your waste management. At the bottom there, I have sustainable objectives, right? Because all this comes back to that. You have your greenhouse, em greenhouse gas emissions, your waste management, your waste diversion. All these things have to be tied in and then reported to your sustainability group. And then it eventually gets rolled up to a, like an annual report that's sent out that's publicly available. So more specific to power redundancy. So I was talking about asset management, right? So most companies I've talked to, they don't usually track at the component level. Usually, you know, all assets you have, right? You have IT management and maybe you have facility assets management but you may not know what components are coming in and out of your, your facilities, right? You don't know your batteries, you don't know your filters, you don't know other supporting components, right? So without that proper life cycle management, you're not able to actually improve your waste management. So it's important to start looking at that and see if there's ways you can improve your, your asset management and start tracking down to those components. Next is proactively monitoring and maintaining. So you know, problem change management is key. I think we all have that. But I think it's really key to understand here is that you need to understand here is your history, right? If you don't have a good history on how things have been happening to your assets, how they've been failing, you're not going to be able to do your predictive analysis that's required to kind of help determine if you can continue using that product for another five years, 10 years, or maybe it's going to fail in six months. You're not going to know it until maybe you do sort of a schedule night, um, <clears throat> type of schedule maintenance to determine if it's going to fail. Uh, next is warranty and support contracts and consumables. So there's also, I've talked to a few companies that they say, I ask them, do you know what your warranty information is? And they say, no, 
I have no clue. <laughs> All we know is we have a third party vendor that comes in and replaces them. And then sometimes we find out and they say, oh, I didn't realize this warranty expired two years ago and we're still using them. So it's very important. That's why I tie it all back to asset management, because without that type of information, you're not going to be alerted to say, hey, these things are out of warranty. You probably should replace them. And the last is safe handling and storage of hazardous materials. So lead acid batteries is a hazardous material, and there are certain processes and procedures that have to be followed. So usually there's you know, building management or third-party vendors that come in to help you manage these things. Um, but if you're doing it yourself, you have your own electrical engineers, um, it's important that you have standardized processes across the board to maintain that process. Because if you don't, um, you can have different ways of uh, uh, handling that and then also not handling that, sorry, having problems handling that waste and having that supplied sent to the suppliers. All right, here's an example of um, a UPS uh, endeavor we did to kind of show how we can kind of manage the, the batteries within the UPS unit. And um, using those, we can actually, we can actually substitute, I have UPS batteries here, but they could be anything. It could be any consumable that you currently have. Um, you, it's important that, like I said, that asset management is the kind of the key backbone to everything. So if you can, it can manage it down to the battery level, you can trigger on warranty issues, you can trigger on maybe some type of process saying that, okay, a vendor's come in to replace something, I need to schedule a pickup to be recycled, right? Um, that in, 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 uh, gets transferred over to like the uh, middle part there, the vendor haulers. So if you don't have a good relationship with your vendor haulers, and let's say if they come pick it up, and two months later you're like, I never heard back from you guys, what happened to those batteries, or what happened to these consumables? They say, oh, you know, we sent you an email about that. Oh, well, our sustainability group is you know, calling us and asking us about this. So it's important that you work with those vendor haulers, make sure they're doing the proper disposal and are providing that certificate right back to you. Either it's either stored within your, your asset management system or maybe even directly sent to your sustainability team, right? making sure that they're managing that and reporting on that correctly. All right. Best practices, so like I said, traceability, audibility, super important, right? Without that, you're never gonna be able to, to actually improve your processes. Do a life cycle assessment. There's actually some ISO state, uh, uh, statements out there that you can look at to kind of provide some ideas of how to actually do your life cycle, life, life cycle assessment for any product that you have. Uh, next one is full material disclosures. So most companies, the most manufacturers, they all provide some type of safety data sheet or some other type of disclosure telling you what that product is containing. If it's hazardous, if it has um, lead, acid, for example, for the batteries, or maybe it's fully recyclable, or maybe it's, it's made out of cardboard. These are all important things, right? Because it helps you determine, hey, we're not currently handling this particular component correctly, but how can we do that better, right? By looking at those, those materials that make up that product. How to be successful. So electrical distribution efficiency. So most, systems, most companies do like a two-end deployment where let's say you have UPS systems and you're gonna deploy eight of them, let's say, but then you're gonna have to say, well, eight will support our facility, but we really need to have some redundancy there, right? So we'll put another eight out there. Well, that's twice as many batteries that you have to manage and have to recycle or pull or purchase, right? So something that's also important is to say, okay, what type of software and hardware can we use to um, reduce the redundancy out that we have with that, right? How can we be more predictable with failures, right? So we're not surprised that we have a failure within a particular data center, right? Because the whole battery went offline. Facilities management, so water, especially in Arizona, it's really big, closed loop systems, cooling those batteries, you know, make sure you understand what's happening to that water after it's, you know, coming out of the closed loop system, because sometimes it doesn't last forever. So making sure you understand what, how, what your processes and procedures are for that water, that wastewater management. And, I, and like I said before, standardized processes and procedures with your vendors, because without that, you're not gonna be able to improve your, your overall life cycle management. Uh, next is supply chain and vendor management. Clear guidance uh, for the current and future vendors is really important. Um, 
because you need certain standards with them to be more transparent, right? If you're not transparent, you're not going to be able to understand what they're doing with it. And you might be getting, like I said, paper copies of them. And if you don't even know if they're readable sometimes, or they come in kind of blurry and you have someone that has to come and actually manually read that and enter it in. So if you need to be able to make sure that you understand what your vendors can and can't do, can they send you an electric copy, right? And can that electric copy then be sent to whatever system that's maintaining that information so that you can process it later? And of course, last asset management I've talked about several times. All right. PDF curves. So I'm assuming there's some people out here who've seen this before. It's going to be quick talk, quickly talked about this, right? P is just basically something starting to fail, right? It's, it's moving to eventually going to fail someday, right? So what we want to do is move to that whole predictive phase, right? Being more predictive of how we can manage our assets and predict when they're going to fail within, let's say, six months or a week or a few days, right? Whatever that may be, if we can predict a failure before it actually ever happens, that's the best pro possible process. Preventative actions, of course, you know, if you're always doing some type of scheduled maintenance, those are preventative actions. And then also inspections. If you're finding actually an error during the inspection, it's kind of a scary thing, right? Because all of a sudden you're doing a manual check and you're saying, oh, these are running hotter than expected. Our sensors may not be working. Why don't we detect that, right? Because without that inspection, it'll lead to ultimate failure, which could be a fire, right? Or any other disaster. And here's an example of something that's actually happened to a particular battery catching on fire. So I'm not sure if anyone here has actually seen issues with lead acid batteries, but um, this can happen to lithium ion. It can happen to um, even lead acid batteries, right? They all can catch fire. They can <laughs> destroy a whole data center, right, if this happens. So it's important that, you know, even though we're, we're putting, you know, these batteries in place to be more redundant for the power supply usage, right, the power supply, it can also cause us a complete outage or even destru destruction of our, our facility. So it's important that we understand how we monitor, right? Do we monitor at the, the jar level or as a system as a whole? And then what's my mean time before failure, right? If you don't know that, that's, you know, you can find out that either that from the manufacturer or from historical use of that battery. All right, so how can you improve on it? So this is kind of moving into the POC that we're doing within the China System Center. So a new hybrid approach of looking at and trying to replace batteries based on a particular criteria. So for example, looking at the internal resistance based on such factors as the voltage, the temperature, charge and discharge rates, the actual environmental conditions of the area, because as especially in Asia, air quality is really, it could be a concern with a lot of different components, right? Just because if it's too humid, the air quality is bad, it's getting in the components, causing dirt to gather within the systems. You don't have proper filtration. All of these come to you know, factors that you need to model and understand so that you can help predict how to replace these batteries in the future. This is an example of our uh, full stack sustainability that we're actually implementing in uh, across the globe. So we have the China System Center that's using this. Uh, we have another site within the UK called Hursley that's also implementing this. Uh, but what I'm focusing on today is level zero and level one, which is building an asset management and the facilities. So being able to monitor all those assets within the facilities using data collectors, right? So in some case situations, we have actually sensors that spread out through the whole floor to understand what's going on with temperature and environmental factors, along with just having sensors on the different equipment to see what temperature fluctuations are happening, voltage regulations, things like that. Next is observability. So most people have this, right? You have a system you're monitoring, you have a dashboard, you can see it, you can look at it. This is great, right? I can see what the process, you know, what's happening to my active systems, right? What's happening to my voltage supplies from my UPS batteries, what's happening, whatever, right? But that can only get you so far, right? How, how often do you go to look at a dashboard, <laughs> right? So you need some type of feeding system that's feeding that into some type of analysis process or some optimization process to determine, hey, I'm determining something that's out of scope. You know, we've defined some KPIs and all of a sudden, hey, we're not meeting those KPIs. Maybe we should go look and see why we're not meeting those, those KPIs through some type of preventive maintenance. And then ultimately moving to some type of automated process, right? If once that's fully defined and you have a well 
set up system for analysis and optimization, you can work on either either remote assistance where you can say call someone out and get it fixed immediately, or maybe have no no hands on keyboard and actually having it fixed for you automatically. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, proof of concept that was deployed. I hope it's okay, readable. Um, I made it a little bit bigger. So the focus is on the blue box. So you see that kind of wrapped around. Kind of also like I was talking about before. The first is ingestion of the data, right? Gathering of that data, the performance data, and then using you know dashboarding tools to show that we, you know how we can look at the what's happening with the state of the batteries, uh, using those uh, over time. Let's say if we have it over maybe a five minute interval, an hour interval. Um, all that matters because depending how often you're measuring it, conditions can, conditions can change. Uh, next is health and predict. Um, taking that information, like I said, moving that from the next stage of just having a dashboard and feeding that into some type of health and predict system that you can actively monitor the health of the battery is key to basically being able to do predictive maintenance and, and fixing the problems. And then the far right side, we didn't actually implement any of this within our labs, um, but assist and automation, that's where we want to go next, right? Once we have the models down and our scoring down correctly, we can start moving to assist and automation of those processes so that we don't have to, you know, be more predictive about our, our replacements. Uh, KPIs. So we set up for our particular modeling, we had a max score of 48. Um, and that can be weighted any way that you want based on manufacturers. And this could be for any you know, process or asset that, you, that you're monitoring. But in this particular model, we use 48. And the health score is basically that weighted score times 100 divided by the max score. And then that gives us some uh, basically a, a health monitor score so that we can see if that's rising or lowering so we can determine the health of that asset. And then. Uh, also have um, customized scores for, I have SOC, which is uh, state of charge, and SOH, state of health, right? So I'll show you the state of charge on one of the demo slides. You'll see that kind of the upper right. State of health is a little bit different because that goes to the whole predictability and modeling, and we'll talk about that towards the end here. So here's a little bit of a, kind of a blowout of that table you saw on the bottom, right? So. Our impact factors are include temperature, right? And those are through meter readings. Uh, you can see, we'll have these slides available so you can actually see the stuff that you can't read from, from far distances. But um, next is cycle, cycle number. So this is how many discharge and recharges you're doing. So to do well, some of the things like the capacity and the resistance, and maybe even sometimes of the voltage changes as you're discharging it, um, this number is important, right? Because with lead acid batteries, you'll have only a set number of cycles before that actual battery fails. And then the voltage resistance are both sensor readings. These are things we don't want to be going out and checking every so often, right? These should be always monitored in, with a certain interval. And of course, the last two are capacity, which is discharge time, and of course, the battery age, right? That goes back to the whole warranty tracking and how, how long that battery's been in service, or maybe if it has been in, in your uh, supply closet. Here's a little bit more about those uh, two KPIs I, KPIs I was mentioning before, state of charge. Um, the first one is to show the amount of electrical charge left within a battery. Right. The impacted factors are battery, chemistry, the voltage, the current, the capacity, the dependence, uh, the charging discharge rate, and the temperature. So if you see that discharge curve on the right, that was actually provided by one of the manufacturers. So you can kind of see when they did their own analysis of that, they will provide a, a discharge curve you should see over time. So as part of the, our mo modeling on the state of charge, we use that to kind of provide a better state of health going forward, right? Because if we're not meeting that curve, something's not right with that battery. And of course, the state of health, as I was just referring to, right? Same thing, the battery age, cycle, time, capacity, internal resistance, energy throughput, temperature, self discharge rate, and the voltage. This is the overall architecture. I'm gonna zoom in to the, the bottom here, because this is kind of the important piece where we have you know, the monitoring through the power meter. So we actually have 
monitoring at the PDUs, and then we also have monitoring at the actual UPS systems themselves. And those are all going through an I2 gateway. And then we also have the environmental matrix metrics that I was referring to before. So like the air quality, temperature, humidity, all of those are going to the IT, IoT gateway. Um, the electrical metrics, like the UPS battery controls. Um, with the, our particular setup, we're using Omnio because we're using some IBM products to, to, analyze, to do the analysis for, for predictability. So that's going through Omnio, Omnio Edge, and that's eventually being fed into a monitoring system that does the predictive analysis through, through machine learning. So uh, here's a, a view of the demo we're going to touch on here shortly. Um, uh, one thing I want to kind of help you guys focus in on is it's kind of hard to see, but on the top right is the state of charge. So he'll talk about, uh, you all will talk about that uh, in a minute and how that's imp impactive. Uh, but then you can kind of see the, all the details information on the dashboard that is available. And then I'm going to actually kick off a little video here that uh, you want to put together to kind of show you the, the dashboard. Let's give you a quick tour first for a closer look at our data center. The first thing you will notice are the primary cooling system, including outdoor magnetic trailer and the cooling tower for data center cooling. We also have backup air cooled trailer and other equipment to ensure efficient cooling operations. Inside the data center server room, various network cable trays are placed to serve different purposes. This house Ethernet networks for high speed connections and fiber optic cables for storage area networks. The layout of the hot air containment system greatly addresses the cooling challenges of high performance computing equipment. This is the backbone of the data center, responsible for routing, switching, and securing all network data. It plays a vital role in ensuring seamless connectivity and safeguarding network security. The dashboard you are seeing displays the real time operating data from 160 batteries mounted on the data center UPS. We collect the operating status from sensors installed on each battery and summarize the heat here so that the administrators can easily see the current key metrics and historical data. This includes the total IT loading supported by the batteries and the backup runtime the batteries can provide and the various parameters such as voltage, current, temperature, and the internal resistance of each individual battery. An administrator can easily choose to view detailed data of each battery or analyze data based on groups. One thing he didn't show, unfortunately, um, since he, Meg wasn't here, we had to throw this together real quickly. One thing we weren't able to show and maybe what we can do after the presentation is put another video out there on the predictability and how that's being done. Because this is just showing the, the dashboard and kind of showing, if you, if I show you on this, let me go back one. There's an example here of like a spike, right? And that spike actually happened during a, a change out event. And so you can kind of, you know, these are miscellaneous or not miscellaneous. These are things that happen that you need to kind of understand why do we have a spike, right? So that goes back to the whole predictive modeling and, and, and normalization that I was talking about before. Um, and like I said, we'll have a video probably posted online. So you guys are, if you're interested in understanding the whole predictability piece of it, um, you can kind of see how that's being modeled. All right. Last couple of things here is uh, talking about kind of merging technologies. So path of maturity is really important, right? So how, how do you get there? Um, number one is sensors, right? Not going out and manually testing out these things. Working with your, let's say if you have a building manager or a vendor, making sure that you're working with them to get the, the sensors installed correctly and properly and that 
the systems are set up so that you yourself can look at them and not you know, just the vendor themselves, right? Because you want to be able to see what's happening within your known data centers, right? Not hopefully relying on someone to tell you, hey, something's going to fail or we're seeing something happen, or maybe they don't even tell you something happens and all of a sudden something does happen. So it's important that you get that, you know, that transparency of what uh, sensors they have installed and seeing what's happening within your equipment, within your data centers. Um, next is asset failure predictability using AI and ML, right? So which is what I was totally referring to. Without that historical information on your you know, problems, the historical information on the health, the, the voltages, the currents, all those things, you can't do machine learning to understand what, you know, when things are not failing. So the more data you have, the better it is, and the better the models. But then moving, once you have the models down and you have, you know, you trust them, then you can start moving into automation, maybe calling out a technician to service it before something actually happens, and maybe integrating that with other processes and procedures that you have. And then the last thing I have is actually break down the silos, which is, is really key to kind of start, it's not a technology, it could, be, it could be technology, right? Making sure that you're working with your third-party vendors, making sure you're working with sustain, your sustainability group, or make sure, making sure you're working with your IT department, making sure you're working with your SE, SRE people, right? Making sure you're working with, everyone's talking, because usually what happens is everyone runs in their own silos, and they just care about what's happening in their, day, you know, their normal day job. But it's important that you have, you know, either some type of technology or open communication between these different business units, because without that, you're never going to be able to improve your processes and procedures to actually mature and, and make things better for your, your company and your enterprise. Uh, this is the last slide here. So emerging technology, I have uh, some links here. That The first few ones are what we used to help understand what are the open standards that are out there and how we should be approaching this from our, you know, uh, as a starting base. So things like SCI and you know embedded carbons, how to how to measure these things based on different factors, and the last few links at the bottom there are actually uh, links to uh, these different dashboards, and the other one of the other links should also have a link to um, that modeling I was talking about before. And so if you have any. Uh, yeah, Actually, thanks. And that's all I have today. So if there's any questions, I can help answer those.